All right, thanks everyone for coming. We're going to start off directly with uh, Commander Hartsock to go over our presentation today of the most recent OIS. Following that, Chief uh, Medina is going to say a few words about this and talk a little bit about the, the new contract issues with Dr. Ginger, and then we'll take questions. Okay. Kyle. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Interim Commander Kyle Hartsock. I'm with the Investigations Bureau in the Albuquerque Police Department. We're here today to talk about an officer-involved shooting incident that took place on March 29th, 2023 in the 4600 block of Glendale Road Northwest. This briefing will provide information about a male who was shooting a gun in a residential neighborhood and upon police arriving, pointed it at another person, resulting in an officer-involved shooting. You're about to see relevant video footage, 911 audio, photos, and learn about other evidence and police procedures related to the case so you can have a better understanding of what occurred based on what we know right now. The Albuquerque Police Department conducts very thorough criminal and use of force investigations, which typically require investigators to interview multiple witnesses, a few hours of video footage, and analyze a significant amount of forensic evidence. We're still at the early stages of this investigation, which can often take several months to complete. Our understanding of the incident may change as this additional evidence is collected, analyzed, and reviewed. We also do not draw any conclusions about whether the officers acted consistent with our policies and the law until all the facts are known and the investigation is complete. A word of caution, the images and video may be disturbing. When police officers use force to arrest a subject or defend against an attack, it can be graphic and difficult to watch. In addition, there may be strong language by those shown in the video. There was five officers who fired their guns during this incident. All the officers at the time of the shooting were assigned to the Southwest Area Command, and as of today, all of the officers are back on active duty. Officer Anthony Guetta got hired by the department in 2014 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. Officer Ralph Rodriguez was hired with it by the department in 2014 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. Officer Garrett Maxson was hired by the department in 2016 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. Officer Eduardo Munoz was hired by the department in 2017. He also has no prior officer-involved shootings. And Officer Angel Ortiz Arvizo was hired by the department in 2022 and has no prior officer-involved shootings. The person who was shot at by police was 32-year-old Francisco Macias, a resident of Albuquerque. <clears throat> the incident we're here to talk about took place in the Southwest Area Command of the Police Department. The location was in the 4600 block of Glendale Road, Northwest, which is near Central and 47th Street. On March 29, 2023, a distressing incident took place in that 4600 block of Glendale Road where police officers were dispatched to respond to an aggravated assault and possible domestic dispute. According to the initial caller, a male offender, later identified as Francisco Macias, was physically assaulting two women, later determined to be his mother and aunt. They reported that Francisco appeared to be under the influence of an unknown narcotic and was exhibiting abnormal behavior. The situation became more dangerous when 911 callers informed us that Francisco was in possession of a firearm and actively shooting it in the front yard of the residence. As officers began to arrive on scene, they were flagged down by an uninvolved male individual near the intersection of Central and 47th Street. The man appeared to be in a state of shock uh, and appeared to be visibly afraid. He told officers he witnessed a male firing a gun down the street. Dispatch was also telling officers that uh, on 911 calls, they could hear gunshots in the background as several people in the area were calling 911 all at once. Based on that information, officers proceeded with caution as they approached the scene of the incident. They were aware the suspect still could be in the area and, the at the, and that the situation could be dangerous. The first video I'm gonna show you was recorded on a cell phone by one of someone in the neighborhood uh, that was filming before police arrived. Um, the video shows uh, Francisco firing shots in the air, uh, which is the first video. The second video I'm going to show you takes place a few minutes after the first video, but it's going to show Francisco firing in the air again. His friends or family or neighbors are trying to disarm the gun from him. Uh, as police start to arrive on scene, the individual filming continues to record but sets the phone down 
So we don't see video, but the audio still contains the shooting. Uh, so we're going to play that video for a few minutes so you can uh, get a better idea of what it was like to be at that scene that day. Uh, here's the first video showing the first shots fired in the air. And here's the second video again. This is approximately four minutes after the first video. Simba! Simba, stop! said earlier, multiple 911 calls came in during this incident. We're going to play three of them for you today. The first one is from one of the two female victims. Hello? 911 emergency. Hello? 911 emergency. What's the address of your emergency? 
Francisco Macias, the person with the gun, also call 911. Here's part of his call. Albuquerque 911, where is your emergency? Hello, I'm at 4620 Glendale Road, uh, actually Glendale Place, Northwest. Uh -huh. um, there's some people inside that are holding my mom hostage. Okay. I'm holding my mom hostage. I, I, need, I need people out here to get my mom out of here. Who's holding your mom hostage? There. These people, I don't know, sir. I, don't, I have no idea. These people are just holding my mom. Hot. Did you already call her? Out there. Did you already call her? I, I called, no, I, I'm calling you right now. Well, uh, what is your name again? Francisco Macias. Okay, hold on, please. And again, several neighbors called in. We're going to play one of those calls right now. 911 emergency. Yeah, we need the cops over here. What's the address? When it's possible, they're shooting. Some guy hit my mom. What is the so address? We need to get the cops over here. We're at 4625 Glendale, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Is that a house? And he's shooting the gun outside. 4625 or 20? 25. Glendale? The guy is at, uh, across the street. And he's shooting a gun at who? He's, I don't know if he's aiming it over here or not, but you okay. guys need to hurry up and get here. Because he hit my mom. He hit your mom with a gun? Yes. Literally. With his How long ago did he hit your mom? He's out there with a gun in the front yard. How long ago did he hit your mom with his fist? My brother has a gun. If he comes over here, we're going to use it. As officers made their way to the intersection of Glendale and 47th Street, they spotted Francisco in a front yard of Glendale Drive Northwest. He was shirtless and wearing a pair of white sweatpants and was obviously armed with a handgun. The officers quickly took cover behind a red car and a black SUV that were parked along the curb just west of where Francisco was. Despite repeated orders from officers to drop his firearm, Francisco remained steadfast and refused to comply. Instead, he walked behind a black avalanche truck that was parked in the driveway. There were two males who were near Francisco during this incident, who the investigation would later determine to be known to Francisco. According to the officers, it appeared the two males were trying to get Francisco to drop the firearm. The officers observed Francisco raise the firearm towards one of the males, and an officer-involved shooting took place. Our air support was responding to this incident and does capture part of it. You're only hearing the audio from the helicopter. So you will have some audio, but it's not the audio from down below. We'll play that for you now. Officer Maxson was one of the officers who fired his gun that day. We're going to play you his video now. Seguera, who also fired his gun that day, was recording, and here's his video of the shooting.
was taken from a neighbor's house by a citizen. The video is taken west of Francisco, which is kind of in line from the perspective the officers had as they approached. <laughs> We zoomed in on this video a little bit and want to show you that right before the shooting takes place, the two witnesses or victims that were there both start to put their hands up and they're facing Francisco. At the same moment, the officers are saying he's pointing the gun at him. There's no audio on this, it's just a zoomed in. After the shooting, Francisco fled towards the back of the house. He encountered one of the same victims from the front yard and they fought. That victim was able to take Francisco's gun from him and threw it over a fence into a neighboring yard. Francisco would soon thereafter jump a fence to go into a separate neighbor's yard than the one the gun was in and encountered the other victim that was in that front yard who was now laying on the ground. <clears throat> Francisco lifted that victim up and started to use him as a shield as officers started to approach. Officers surrounded Francisco and the victim, telling Francisco to surrender, but Francisco did not obey commands. Officers saw Francisco holding the victim in what appeared to be a chokehold. An officer fired a less than lethal 40 uh, millimeter munition round at Francisco in an attempt to get him to let, release the hostage, but it did not appear to be effective. Another officer used a taser to make Francisco release the victim. Francisco resisted arrest and was eventually handcuffed. We're gonna show you the air support video and then I'm gonna show you the tasing video separately.
this video here is from the officer that would eventually tase Mr. Macias. But we're going to start it when the shooting happens, just to kind of show you the difficulty of the layout that the officers had to work with. And when he started jumping fences, um, it was it's trickier than what it appears for them to find him. Uh, so here's that video. scene diagram that shows the officers who fired were approximately 85 and 92 feet away when they fired on Macias. In total, approximately 46 casings were recovered from this crime scene. 36 of them were 223 rounds from police rifles. One was a 9 millimeter round that we believe to be from a police handgun and there were nine 40 millimeter casings which we believe came from Mr. Macias's handgun. This was the damage that the Chevy Avalanche received. The gun that Francisco fired was found in this flower pot in a neighboring yard. Francisco Macias did possibly receive a gunshot wound that day um, into his foot. And actually just yesterday, um, through a medical procedure, a projectile was recovered from his foot. While it does appear to be a gunshot wound, at this point it's unclear if it came from his own weapon or one of our weapons. Francisco was arrested that day and booked into MDC. The DA's office, however, recently was forced to dismiss the case when all four victims were contacted by prosecutors and told them they would not participate in any prosecution. 
Francisco is currently not in jail. Over the next several months, the Albuquerque Police Department will continue to investigate and analyze this incident. We will continue interviewing any new witnesses that come forward and complete any forensic test. After the investigation is complete, our force review board will forward the findings to the superintendent of police reform to determine if this incident met the high standards of the Albuquerque Police Department. The MATF will forward their criminal investigation to the district attorney's office who will make any determination of criminal charges. And that concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions for you guys. Yeah. How many, or does Chief wanna, sorry. You know, one of the things I wanna point out and I wanna discuss is, uh, you know, we've made some changes. We had a board that met. We made some uh, changes on how we want to process forward. And there is a lot of those things that the officers did today, did on this day in particular, that really lead to what we've been trying to change. I want you to look and we see that there was a lieutenant on scene, that our officers slowed things down. They gathered themselves. They approached this as a group. And then after the first shots were fired, we didn't have officers chasing the guy down the alley immediately. They took their time, they progressed forward safely. They then transitioned to less lethal. We talked about it during our review of uh, our use of force cases from last year, our shootings where we wanted people to use less lethal. You hear them talking at one point, you hear an officer saying, 40 him, 40 him. That's deploying less lethal. You see them transition to less lethal. We didn't have a second shooting after this. Uh, you saw that they had the individual covered and asking him once again to drop his gun. So there's a lot of positive things that occurred during the occurrence of this uh, officer involved shooting. And we're still gonna investigate it, make sure that all policies were were uh, followed. But it, it's, it's very good to see that a lot of the things that we've been concerned about that we see that we're improving upon. And I think this kind of leads to some of the stuff that's occurring this week. Yesterday, a letter went out to the Department of Justice's, uh, the monitor under our, our DOJ process and we asked that our fees be reduced by 40 percent. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, and we already reviewed this case, we once again saw that magnified optics help. Uh, the truth is uh, these processes are above and beyond what our settlement agreement calls for. Uh, generally we used to wait under our settlement agreement till FRB occurred before we made these assessments on one individual shooting. We're now doing it in more real time. We're above and beyond our settlement agreement. And in a lot of ways, our settlement agreement holds us back. You know, I know there's some concerns. I saw a city councilor who was concerned about the fact that we've had these officer involved shootings. You know, and I, I hope that our city councilors who have those concerns look at this as an example of how our officers are improving and that we realize that we have to work as a community, we have to support our officers, and we have to recognize the improvements they've made <coughs> and how we are moving much more faster in this process than our settlement agreement has allowed us, and we've complained about that from the beginning, myself and the mayor, the turnaround time in a lot of these processes, and how some of our processes, we're talking about how we review these shootings more quickly, how we make recommendations. I talked about how the optics is, is something that came up again in another one of these. But if you even look at our community policing councils, uh, our ambassador program is 10 times better than the community policing councils in reaching those segments of the community that haven't always had a voice. So. Uh, we did send that letter out yesterday. I know there is multiple questions and, and uh, Gilbert indicated I would be addressing those. And I hope that we could continue to reduce fees so that we could reinvest some of those fundings into programs and processes within the Albuquerque Police Department that will help us strengthen our police department for, uh, the, the, to meet the needs of the community. And also, uh, it's just like any other process. When less work is done, uh, you would anticipate that you would get paid less not that you would create more work uh, in order to justify the pay. And we are responsible for public dollars and I support our uh, CAO uh, sending this out on behalf of the Albuquerque Police Department. Any questions? Um, you mentioned five officers fired shots. How many total officers were involved in this situation? I responded to the scene? Yeah. I don't have the exact number for you, but you can see in the video, it's, it's, it's several, it's more than the five. And then I also wanted to ask, it was mentioned that one of the bystanders helped wrestle the gun away from the suspect. Where in the timeline did that happen? When you see them run behind the shed, you can actually, we'll give you the video, but you can see them doing this. Oh, yeah. And you, yeah, you can see it on the air footage video. So it's happening right behind the shed. Um, do we know if he was on drugs? 
Uh, we, we don't, um, and drug testing of people that, you know, when if someone dies, that's a standardized process, you know, he didn't. Um, so at this point, we don't have that kind of information to, to share. Matt, that was actually one of the questions I asked in my first briefing of this shooting, and I did ask criminal investigations from this point forward. I think it's important we know, especially during these officer-involved shootings, and when it's possible in the future, we're going to obtain a search warrant for blood to try to determine if we could see if somebody was under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Okay. Do we know where he got his gun? Uh, again, that know? part of the investigation is still ongoing. <clears throat> he wasn't a prohibited person yeah. from owning a firearm. I can tell you that. Um, but we're still tracking down everything with the guns. We do have that information. We're just not ready to share it yet. Okay. And then um, can he be? Uh, I'm just curious, like, so obviously in the video he's shooting off the gun in the front yard and stuff. Um, was there any talk about charging him, like, just based on the evidence of, like, negligent use of a deadly weapon or, like, anything like that? We're in talks with the DA's office okay. on possible other alternate charges. A lot of those are misdemeanor charges. So, again, we're, we're in talks with them, and we're also still talking with Mr. Macias. Mm -hmm. uh, we recovered the bullet from him just yesterday uh, with his cooperation. You know, I think it's important also to view that as like a lot of times our officers get in caught in situations and this is one of those prime examples that we get dispatched to. We saw, you saw the family members, everybody calling, they needed help. We need officers out there. And we're able to go out, we're able to resolve a situation. Sometimes they don't work out like this. I, I'm still amazed that nobody was injured or killed during this whole incident. And then all of a sudden our victims don't wish to cooperate anymore because it does involve a family member so hope that we keep that in mind is that a lot of times our officers are dispatched to these and it just it doesn't work our favor in the end when it comes down to prosecuting these cases as for the two bystanders that were heavily involved with this is there something they should have done different or is there something you would have recommended they do different to not be quite in the light of fire you know uh it's a difficult situation i mean their loved ones they cared for you heard during the whole course of this that they were concerned for his well-being. I think even one of them, you know, kind of hear him in Spanish talking about, you know, his disappointment. And, and then they thought that, that it had ended worse. Uh, it, it's difficult. And I would always recommend victims kind of stay clear. Uh, in this case, it, he actually disarmed him. So, I mean, it was extremely dangerous. And I'm still shocked that something didn't happen, that nobody was accidentally shot. But uh, it's always best to remember that uh, it's very difficult. And you you endanger your own life when you take these actions, but I'm not going to fault them for anything they did. Yes, sir. Yes, Chief, this falls under the DOJ. Why does your director of communications need a police car with lights and sirens? And since he already has one, has he gone through the law enforcement and court driving course? You know, I saw that post. Uh, our director of communications didn't respond to this crime scene. And if we want to discuss that at a later time, we can. But uh, I did. I saw that all over. I saw... Uh, the trolls on social media put posting information that he had re uh, re uh, had responded to the scene and went through. That's absolutely incorrect. Gilbert was not there that night. We spoke to a sworn officer who said that he was on scene. Well, bring that sworn officer forward, file a complaint, and uh, we'll do an investigation. And if a sworn officer lied to you or provided in inaccurate information, we'll make sure we address that. Does that vehicle have lights? He, Gilbert's car, yes, it does have lights. Any other questions? Chief, in regards to uh, this, and you may have expanded on this, but um, charges will not be pressed against this person as of right now since the investigation is underway, is that correct? Yes, there will be no charges, but they are going to review to see if there is any applicable misdemeanor charges and ensure that we're able to charge anything that we can. How has the uh, compliance with him been since this incident occurred? I mean, again, we, we've been in touch with him because we wanted to recover if there was something to recover inside of his foot to help the investigation, we wanted to do that. And to that degree, he notified us when that appointment was going to happen, which was yesterday, and we were there and, and took it. So, I mean, it's showing there is some, some level of communication, but I probably can't speak much more accurate than, than that is. Did you have any um, mental health related calls with APD or anything like that? Not that I'm aware of, and that's one of those concerns is like, we don't know if this individual, and I think a lot of family members said that this individual was not known to use drugs. This individual has no documented mental health history, and it really leads the question is what happened this day? So I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions as to the state of this individual's mind and what's going on, and, and uh, hopefully we could get some answers, and if there is an opportunity for us to add additional resources to this individual's 
uh, our plan for this individual in the future, we could get them the help they need to, hoping that we could use that through some of our other social service departments. We also took another firearm from the house that was inside, and we also seized that gun as well, and we still possess both firearms in this one. Um, he can get those back, though, if he doesn't, if there's no other charges filed. They're still tagged as, as evidence right yeah. now, so right now he would not be able to get them back, which is why we're still working with the district attorney's office um, on other possible routes. And uh, for the Ginger um, letter, has he responded? You know, Dr. Ginger, in the midst of writing our 17th monitor's report, 17? Yes. 17, it's slated to come out in mid-May, and he did indicate that he would review uh, the, docu the, the request. He would look at their expenses, travel expenses, take into account, and that uh, he would get back to the city of Albuquerque. Yes? Um, you said You, you know, that'd be general medical information that uh, we probably wouldn't be provided with or that we wouldn't have uh, the ability to obtain at this time, so we'll but, look. But he's flagged inside of our internal system with that, that unit as well. So as far as the police department is concerned, if we can give him resources, we will, um, even if they're involved in a police shooting because we, we don't want it to happen again. Did the suspect have any prior criminal history? He did not have a, an extensive history, no. Very minor history. Mm -hmm. Like this would be one of those cases where you'd look at the person who were involved in this incident and it's kind of shocking looking at their background. It's not what we typically would expect. And that's why it begs that question. No drug use history that we're being told about doesn't seem to be going through a known uh, mental uh, health concerns of the past and all of a sudden you end up with this. Okay, thank you everybody. Yep, thanks.